Good evening, everyone, and um, welcome to Politics and Prose. I'm uh, Brad Graham, the co-owner of the store, along with my wife, Alyssa Muscatine, and uh, we're very privileged to uh, have with us uh, this evening uh, Michael Cohen, uh, here to talk about his new book, Revenge, How Donald Trump Weaponized the U.S. Department of Justice Against His Critics. Uh, now, for all the media that, uh, that Michael uh, does and has been doing for years, um, this is the first time he's uh, actually appeared in an independent bookstore. Now, he, uh, he skipped this. He, he, uh, he had to skip this format uh, for his first book, Disloyal, which was a memoir that came, back, uh, came out two years ago, you know, while the pandemic was uh, still going on. Um, and, 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 uh, but this time, you know, as he was telling me a few minutes ago, you know, he wanted to appear in, in person to, um, uh, to, uh, to help get, get his message across. Um, and that message is, is, is basically that um, the way Donald Trump uh, used the uh, Department of Justice, uh, members of, of, of his own party, the press, social media, uh, to go after uh, opponents and, and critics uh, should be a lesson for all of us. Uh, Michael argues that his own experience, in, uh, which he felt subjected to injustices by Trump and associates like uh, former Attorney General Bill Barr, should serve as a warning to anyone who would try to stand against a, a corrupt and uh, immoral uh, president. Uh, for those of you who might need reminding, um, Michael was uh, Trump's lawyer and served as an executive at the Trump Organization uh, for, for a dozen years. Uh, that relationship ended in May 2018 as Michael became embroiled in a federal criminal investigation into, among other things, the hush money that he paid on Trump's behalf to Stormy Daniels and Karen McDougal to stay silent about affairs they had with Trump. A few months later, uh, Michael pleaded guilty to tax evasion and campaign finance vi violations and was sentenced to three years in prison and, and fined. Uh, he was released to a house arrest uh, after a year because of COVID concerns, then re-jailed, uh, then returned to home confinement. His sentence expired last November. Uh, he's become a very vocal uh, critic of, of Trump, uh, offering to Congress and, and anyone who will listen uh, disparaging accounts of the way Trump operated, calling him a con man, a cheat, and, and more. Uh, when the New York Attorney General recently announced a civil lawsuit for fraud against Trump, uh, Trump's family business, and three of his children, she credited Michael's congressional testimony with initially shedding light on the misconduct and um, triggering New York's investigation. Uh, Michael himself has expressed remorse and shame for what he did while working for Trump, although he maintains the tax evasion charges he pled guilty to were untrue and were forced on him by prosecutors. Uh, uh, I expect you'll hear a little bit more about that in, in a minute. And these days he runs a crisis management company, Crisis X, uh, and hosts a podcast, uh, Mea Culpa with Michael Cohen. So uh, please join me in welcoming Michael Cohen. Well, well, well. Got to be very honest with you. First of all, when I was in school, I never thought in my life I would become an author. Least of all, a number one New York Times bestselling author, which is what happened in Disloyal. And I go back in time and I start thinking about, oh my gosh, you know, why did I even write Disloyal? Well, I actually wrote Disloyal simply to pass time because in prison, time management is everything. I mean, if you, if you don't have good time management skills, 24 hours could feel like 240 hours. The hardest part about being in prison was, as I talk about in this book, revenge. I didn't belong there. And what I talk about is exactly what happened to me. And most people don't even know the real story. Everybody talks about Michael Cohen. Everybody has an opinion. They have you know, some idea in terms of who I was, what I was. I was not, let me be very clear. I was not Ray Donovan skulking around the city with a baseball bat, hitting people with it as the media would like to have portrayed me. What did I do? I sued people. I sued people on behalf of Donald Trump. I was a lawyer. 
And that's exactly what we do. Now, some of the cases were, let's just say, less than on the up and up. It was a way for Donald to take advantage of his economic power, the fact that there were a dozen lawyers in the firm uh, in the office over at the Trump organization, and it was generally contractors. And everybody's like, oh my gosh, you know, you're a terrible human being. You're horrible. Look how many people that you hurt. Well, with all due respect to a lot of the people that got hurt, some of them were really lousy contractors, right? And the things that they had done were improper, and we did what anybody else would do. We used the law, not baseball bats, not golf clubs. And the notion that we have to make Donald Trump into Don Corleone and everybody that works for him is a consigliere or something to that effect, it's just not accurate. Fast forward all of that, I do end up coming out of Otisville. And I do have to tell you, even though it was what's known as Camp Cupcake, it's I never saw a single cupcake while I was there. And that really upset me. You know, I was first told, you're going to Camp Cupcake. Great. I love cupcakes. You know, just make sure there's some black coffee. I'm going to be perfect. Unfortunately, there was none. And it's very hard being away from your family, your friends, losing your law license, your family's happiness, everything. It is absolute torture. The entire judicial system needs an overhaul. So who was with me? Well, I had an actor, Mike, the situation was there. It was absolutely a riot watching um, Jersey Shore. About half a dozen doctors, orthopedists, um, podiatrists, you name it. We had um, at least two dozen lawyers. Uh, Billy McFarlane from <laughs> Billy McFarlane from Fire Festival was there for a short while. Uh, <laughs> uh, let me who we had accountants galore. My bunkie was a forensic accountant. We would talk constantly about the case and why. So going now to revenge, I want to really fast forward it here. Oh, before I get there, the unconstitutional remand, making me the very first political prisoner. Hello, everybody. I am, should be in the Guinness Book of World Records. I am the very first political prisoner held in my country because I failed to waive my First Amendment constitutional right which is exactly what happened. This nonsense by Fox News. Oh, I was at Bill Bouquet eating a steak. It's 800 feet from my home, and I was permitted to be exactly where I was because I was on a furlough. So I get lured, and I talk about this in the book, I get lured down to 500 Pearl Street, which <laughs> is the criminal case. And I'm saying, why are they sending me there? I'm supposed to go to the Bronx like everybody else for an ankle monitor. And a guy named Adam Pakula, who works there, says to me, no, 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 we want you coming here. And I said, okay, fine, I'll go there. But something didn't smell right, didn't feel right. So I asked a buddy of mine, who was a uh, friend of mine since we were about the age of 14, also a lawyer, just to join me, because I wanted a second set of eyes. We get there, and they hand me a piece of, uh, two pieces of paper. Didn't look like standard government types document, you know, which is, Something that looks like it's been photocopied 600 times. You could barely read it. And you could, luckily, if you figure out where exactly, you know, your name is supposed to go. It was designed specifically for me. And the very first paragraph of it was that I would not publish the book. I would not do a movie. I would not speak to the press. I would not speak to the media. That my family would not speak to the media or the press. That my friends would not speak to it. And I said, wait, wait. This is a violation of my First Amendment constitutional right. I mean, could we tamp down some of this language? And they said, sure. Okay, great. So they had me sit with my lawyer friend, Jeff, in the waiting area. And so I sit and I wait. And it was very sad because my son, uh, who at the time was 21, was waiting for me in the front. Um, he had come in from college. Um, and it was it was rough. So he was sitting in the front. And all of a sudden, about an hour later, three gigantic guys, I mean, humongous federal marshals with handcuffs and shackles. And this was an experience that I don't even know how to characterize. They put me in a freezer. It was a room that must have been 40 degrees. You're wearing a very thin outfit. And it was absolutely horrific for about three and a half hours to the point that you're chattering so hard your teeth feel like they're going to fall out of your head uh, until they pull you out into a room which is like 80 degrees 90 degrees so your body can't acclimate for the temperature and then they put you back into the freezer so it's all a lot of mental torture they run you around them handcuffed and shackled 
For what? For what? Even assuming that I had done what was alleged and what I had pled to, we're going to get to that. Who gets handcuffed and shackled? I mean, this is a white collar. I'm not Hannibal Lecter. I was the former personal attorney to the president, which could be similar, but it's not exactly the same. And I think that the, I think that the um, extent to which they went, this was all done at the direction of Donald J. Trump. So people turn around and they say, well, you know, why would you say that? How can you possibly say that? Well, I'm the first person to get lured away from GEO, which is the, uh, which is the re-entry system that's used and sent over to 500 Pearl Street, given a document that was definitively written for me, though denied. And I get thrown back only to have people from uh, Otisville there to drive me back. Now, what's amazing is today, um, there was an article that came out from, uh, and, it's, and it's an online newspaper called Ross Story. And uh, the author, a uh, young lady by the name of Sarah K. Burris, wrote, um, it's Michael Cohen's lawyer sent this memo days ahead of the SDNY shakedown. And it talks about it into my new book. And I, I really had something that I was going to go into more until I read this while I was on the train coming in today. And I just found it so fascinating that it took a small online newspaper to actually really get the story right. It's, it's, it's to me, again, is amazing. Michael Cohen's lawyer, Guy Petrillo, penned a letter to Deputy U.S. Attorney Robert Kazami that is featured at the end of Cohen's new book, asking for a meeting to discuss the Cohen case and the grand jury. This was, to me, the craziest thing. Four and a half months post the raid. And we have no idea what they're talking about. What are the charges that are being brought against me? Now, to anybody who knows me in the past, I don't drink. I don't do drugs. Never did. I mean, I even went through college here at American University, a fraternity. I never had a beer. And I've really tried to live not like a priest, but rather like an average person. I have one speeding ticket in my entire life. I've never had a parking ticket. All of a sudden, I'm confronted with 40 or 50 federal agents at the hotel, my home, which was two blocks away, so I was not on the lam, as some of the newspapers put it. I was two blocks at the most um, visited hotel, the Lowe's Regency in New York City. I had them at, my, at the bank where I had a um, safety deposit box because... Obviously, my apartment was under renovation. We were flooded out by my next door neighbor. And also my law office, where there were another 20 or so federal agents. And it, it was an overwhelming experience. And for four and a half months, we're asking the Southern District of New York and my former attorney, Guy Petrillo, was the former head of the criminal division of the Southern District of New York. I mean, this guy wore the big boy pants in the Southern District, a.k.a. the Sovereign District of New York. And I want to be very clear, I have no love for these guys at all. So now we, now we sit there and we're really frustrated. Four and a half months, I can't get an answer. What are you looking for? Let me know. If there's something I can help you with, no problem, right? Well, Nope, no answer until finally my attorney decides that he's going to send a letter. It was at my request to them. We'd really like to know. We'd like a sit down. Well, they decide that they're going to have a sit down, but I won't be included into it. It was on a Friday. Okay. So he asked me if it's all right. I said, absolutely, it's okay. Now go ahead and um, call me when the meeting is over, which is exactly what he did. 5.30 p.m. on a Friday night. We find out exactly what it is that I have until Monday to plead guilty to tax evasion, misrepresentation to a bank, as well as campaign finance violation, or we're filing a 58 page indictment against you that's going to include your wife. Now, anybody knows I live for my family, and there was no way in the world that I was going to allow anything to happen to my wife. It was just our, our 20th anniversary a couple of days ago. There's no chance in the world I was going to let them do to her what my attorney told me that they were going to do. They were going to perp walk us out on a Monday. So I had no documents. I had nothing. First time in my life having any issue with law. I've never, and I go into the book here. So I see someone just walked in, Lanny Davis, who was my lawyer and so on. Thank you, Lanny. And... Um, <laughs> Lanny went wild. 
I'm so glad you walked in. Perfect timing. You can't, Lanny, why don't you come take a seat so I can see your pretty face there. So, <laughs> come on. Uh, let's go. Lanny, we're all waiting. We're, we're all waiting. Now that's Barbara's. All right, anyway. So, <laughs> Lanny goes crazy. He goes, this makes absolutely no sense. I mean, and we create a PowerPoint presentation that shows that there are elements in law to tax evasion, which is one of the things that I was given that I had to plead. And they wrote the allocution and everything. I spent more time going over the allocution, how I was to answer to the judge, than I then was spent on my entire case. There was no case that was brought against me. I pled guilty to a one-page information. And you'll see as I go through the book, it's very easy for someone to turn around and point a finger and say, well, yeah, it's your story. You can tell it any way that you want. In fact, we have FBI agents that were involved, starting with the earliest, which you may all remember, the Mueller report. I'm sorry, the uh, uh, Steele dossier. The Steele dossier, as it related to me, 11 allegations raised against me. Not one of them is true. I do not have a dacha in Sochi next door to Putin. My father-in-law is not the largest real estate developer in Moscow, though I wish he was. Um, it, he's, in fact, he's never been to Moscow. He was, he's Ukrainian. And they came to this country in 1973 because of anti-Semitism. All right. Then on top of that, the claim that I went to Prague, which I've never been to Prague. I would like to. I hear it's beautiful, but I've never been. Uh, and I went with $10 million in cash in order to pay off a group of compromats on behalf of Paul Manafort. Truth be told, I wouldn't pay three cents for Paul Manafort. So none of this made any sense. Tax evasion. And I talk about it in the book. I've never not paid my taxes. I've never not filed taxes. I've had a CPA my entire life that I paid. Every single dollar I ever earned was in Capital One Bank that by coincidence was located at the base of the building that I live in. Not one single element of tax evasion existed in my case. Well, okay, what am I gonna do? Put my wife at risk? The answer to that was no. There was no way in the world that I can, that I can do this. And from a Friday to a Monday, 48 hours, you don't do it, this is what's gonna happen. Um, this is what I refer to as the weaponization of the Justice Department. Donald Trump set the whole thing up. Why? Well, as soon as our relationship started coming to an end and things, I refused to do certain things that um, they would want me to do, which of course was to stay quiet, um, that they wanted me to just accept the punishment, move on, basically as I had once said stupidly uh, to Vanity Fair that I would take a bullet for Trump, uh, I probably would have, except for the fact that he was the guy pulling the trigger. And for me, that was a real problem. You know, um, to make a long story short, Sarah goes on in the book Revenge, How Donald Trump Weaponized the United States Department of Justice Against His Critics. It walks through what Cohen describes as the dogged way in which Donald Trump used the government to make his life miserable, attack him, threaten his family, and ultimately land him in prison for a number of crimes. Cohen explains that he never committed. You know, this, the next one after these crazy tax evasion cases, yes, there was an error. I acknowledged it and I paid that money. I never, one thing that uh, that Guy Petrillo was able to get the judge, William H. Pauley III, to acknowledge, I never owed a single dollar to any bank, to any banking institution or any individual ever. There's no economic crime. So again, how could you have a tax evasion? What it was was a tax omission. And I paid the money before sentencing, but I got zero credit for that also. Then the next one, which was the HELOC violation. Do you all know what a HELOC is? The home equity line of credit? I have 80% equity in my home. I had more money sitting in the bank than my mortgage plus the HELOC combined. And somewhere, somewhere down the line, they turn around and they now holding me that I misrepresented myself to the bank. I mean, it, it's, I've been doing business with this bank. I had six buildings. I had 197 apartments. I had, you know, 52 taxi medallions between New York City. I mean, I had worked very hard over the course of the early part of my life. I didn't work for Donald Trump because I needed Donald's job or I needed his money. I was semi-retired at the age of 39. And somehow 
like so many people in America, I fell under the spell of this cult, of this cult leader. And I did things that I never should have done, including the Stormy Daniels. You know, one of the things, sir, that you mentioned in the intro of me, that I had paid off Stormy Daniels and Karen McDougal. I never paid Karen McDougal. I was charged for it. I pled guilty to it. I was fined $50,000 that I paid for it. I never paid Karen McDougal. David Pecker did from AMI, the National Enquirer. I was just asked by Donald to look over the documents as a lawyer to make sure that his ass was protected in the event that David ended up going to Time Magazine where he was supposed to be the next CEO and editor in chief. But somehow they needed to get David out of that too. Because why? Well, Michael was going to be the fall guy. Anything that was negative, anything that was wrong, just point your finger at Cohen. It's all right. Everybody started doing it. All of a sudden, you had Michael Avenatti doing the same thing. Now, all of a sudden, I'm skulking around Nevada looking for Stormy Daniels while she's holding a baby and they're going to some Pilates class. And I'm saying to myself, what next? What next? You know, it, it was... and. <laughs> you're not allowed to say anything. If anybody's ever had any sort of an issue and you, you have a lawyer, the lawyer will say, oh, judges hate. The judges hate when you speak. You can't do that. You have to stay quiet, stay home, do nothing. Okay, and so I did that. What happened? I end up with the 36 months. I, I was saying to myself at, at the time of the hearing, 36 months? For what? And I, I couldn't believe it. I was so angry that I was forced to read this allocution that was prepared for me that... I bit my inner lip so hard and it was like you could see that I was playing with my with my side of my cheek because I was so angry that I, I bit myself and I was just beyond nauseous watching as my father, you know, who is at the time 80, 84, you know, Holocaust survivor came, four children, all of us are lawyers. He's a head and neck reconstructive surgeon. My mom's a surgical nurse. We don't come from a family of mafiosa like they try to, like they try to say. I know people when I was a kid who were in the mob. Absolutely. Right. And so on. Who didn't? Right. I'm from New York. I mean, for God's sakes, it was it was crazy. But we never, you know, <laughs> they weren't we weren't part of any family. This is absolutely OK. Maybe now and then they give us a discount on on some meat or something like that. But for God's sakes, the th it was crazy. All of a sudden, everybody's pointing their finger at Cohen, Cohen, Cohen. And I just became the fall guy for everything. Well, interesting. You know, um, there's an old expression. Um that the three things that will always rise, the sun, the moon, and the truth. And that's what's happening each and every day. More and more information seems to be dripping out. Now, for God's sakes, I wish the spigot would open and it would just flood out. It would make my life so much easier. Drip, drip, drip. We see Jeffrey Berman came out with a book. Um, for God's sakes, this guy did one of two things improper. Either what he did, his actions are unethical or they're illegal. He was contacted by Bill Barr, by Bill Barr's office, and they put pressure on him in order to expunge Donald's name and to pull back the charges against me and the plea that I had made to the Southern District of New York so that they could whitewash the document. And he did still whitewash it. Instead of the 40 pages, it was 20 pages. This is not the way government is supposed to work. And I just scratched my head and I said, where was this guy for five years? Well, okay, right. He needs to hold on to that information so that he could write a book. And I'm saying to myself, this is absolutely improper. It's like Brady material that they withheld that I could have used. Well, is that going to change anything? No. Why? Because I already did my time. And now I'm just on a supervised release that hopefully will be over very, very soon also. You know, sometimes you wake up and you wonder, whose life is this? Because I know that this wasn't mine, right? Yes, I... You know, I had worked, I had built myself a life and a wonderful family, and I was enjoying every single day of waking up. And I can honestly tell you, from that day of that federal raid to today, there is no happiness anymore. There's no joy. I try, I fight every day to put on a smile, to enjoy myself. Um, and I try to do it so that my children don't see, you know, an unhappy father who's just dedicated but one of the things that I also put into this book, because I think it's extremely, extremely important, is some issues regarding the media. The media gives Donald Trump too much attention. Whatever it is that he opens his mouth, he says he could burp, it's going to be all over the news. And it's just, it's absolutely horrific. I mean, we are the ones that are building this guy up. The sentencing report that 
I wrote with Petrillo and Lanny um, as well. It laid everything out. And I, I spoke to so many people in the media, some who I've known for over two decades, friends. I call these people friends. And I would ask them, hey, did you read the sentencing, the Petrillo sentencing memo? Because the story that you're writing in the paper is wrong. And Facts matter. Truth matters. Accuracy matters. But the media didn't see it that way. Like I said, I've never been to Prague, right? I can't tell you the number of journalists that wrote. Michael Cohen told me he was in Prague. No, Michael was in Los Angeles with his son who was hoping to play baseball as a lefty pitcher for USC. And they went to USC and they asked the coach and he said, yeah, they were here. And then the day after, I was on TMZ. I was on set with, with Harvey Levin, who's also a friend. And you can't be in two places at the same time. You know, I'm, people say, oh, you look so familiar. I'm like, oh, you probably, yeah, it's possible. I don't know. Everybody's got a doppelganger. But I've never been to Prague. And no matter how many times that you want to say it, I never have. And then it just, it just explodes there from the steel dossier all the way to the unconstitutional remand. I mean, that was absolutely, that was even more horrific than the first time around. But I want to lay out in this book, Revenge, which is, I believe I accomplished, I wanted to lay out the story of not just what happened to me. That's already happened. It's done. It's over. I have my own internal healing that I have to deal with on a daily basis. If Donald Trump... If a Ron DeSantis, for Josh Hawley, Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, any one of these MAGA morons, to, you know, just if they take power again, they now have the playbook on what it means in order to turn this country into an autocracy. You know, the way you make a country, uh, the way you turn a country into an autocracy, the first thing that you do is you take away people's First Amendment rights, their free speech, and you create a state-run television, media, um, you know, uh, newspapers and so on, like Fox News, all right? That's just what they do. What do you do after that? Well, then you weaponize a group of people. You take over the military. Those are the two things that we saw. We saw January 6th and we saw what happened to me. I believe it was a test run. And I believe that the next person is going to take Donald's failures, because they are both failures, take them and figure out how to make them into successes. We've already seen what's going on with Roe. We see what's going to be happening with Obergefell and a series of other cases. The Supreme Court is out of control. Um, things that we have grown up with 50 years, for example, of Roe uh, as stare decisis, all of a sudden gone. And where's the outrage? Okay, yeah, so a couple of days we see people shutting down the streets, um, picketing, yelling at you know members of Congress. That's not enough. It's not enough. There has to be a movement. And we need to ensure that come November that we make sure that these people are no longer there because, and this is what I say in the book, what happened to me can happen to any one of you, can happen to every one of you, it will certainly happen to a slew of people who are on Donald's hit list, his enemies list. And I can tell you that hit list is probably longer than any scroll that we saw from King Tut's, you know, uh, tomb. I can promise you that he hates everybody that doesn't sit there and flatter him and praise him. I know I, I blew smoke up his ass for over a decade. So I promise you, it is not, it is, you know, it's funny. We could laugh about him. There's not, I mean, he is an absolute cartoon character. When we first started the campaign, campaign was never supposed to be legitimate. It never was. It was, it was supposed to be the greatest infomercial in the history of U.S. politics. I've said it on television a dozen times because it's true. When he got in to the office, he realized what power was. He tasted a power that he had never tasted before, despite the fact, you know, he was obviously the ruler of the 25th and 26th floor of Trump Tower, but nothing like this before. The most powerful man on the planet, and he refused to give it up. And that's why I said when I testified before the House Oversight Committee, my biggest fear, and one of the reasons why I'm here today testifying at tremendous, tremendous cost to me and my family in terms of danger and peril and, you know, and our lives. My biggest fear is that if Donald Trump loses the election, that there will never be a peaceful transfer of power. 
That's a statement that we hear every single day in the press. Sadly, sadly, we hear this every single day in the press. But that came from my mouth going back four and a half years ago. And I'm not prescient. I'm not Nostradamus. I just know the man. And I'm telling you right here, right now, today, in this marvelous bookstore, that if Donald Trump or any of his acolytes end up taking office or power, the, the America that we know, the democracy that we have, will be gone. And we will never get it back. So, blue wave. <laughs> So, Michael, you ready for some audience questions? Oh, do I love questions. <laughs> All right, we got about seven or eight here. Um, the first one uh, asks, as Trump's former lawyer, how do you balance the obligation to protect client confidential information and the attorney-client privilege with the need to disclose what Trump was doing? It's a difficult question. Um, as it relates to attorney-client privilege, you may all remember that when they raided my home, they took 10 million documents. Oh, this, this is a great story. So they, all of a sudden I have 10 burner phones. No, three belonged to my daughter because, you know, children, every year they have to get a new phone and there were photos in them and we didn't want to throw them away and I'm technologically challenged. So I put them into a box in our apartment, right? Um, so that one day we'll find somebody who will be able to put it up onto the cloud or whatever, you know, onto a drive because they're pictures of them when they were children. So there were never, there, there was no burner phones. These were old Apple iPhones. One of them was even a Palm Pilot. The ones that, I don't remember, there's some young people here, you wouldn't remember, but the Palm Pilot was the original one that used to put a battery in in order to charge it. By the time the thing charged, the battery was dead. You had to keep going on and on. So you never, I never, it was never activated because it never worked. You couldn't get a battery to last long enough to keep the charge. These were the things. Uh, you may also remember when they allegedly got uh, some very special documents that were in the shredder in my law office. It was garbage. <laughs> it was, I, I had filled up my garbage pail with garbage, and so I put it in the shredder in order to get rid of it. Envelopes and things like that. The United States paid over at uh, Quantico to put those 18 or 20 pages back that the media ran. Oh, we've got it all. We've got it all. <laughs> What'd you have? You had a bunch of envelopes that I threw into there. 18 pages. That's where our money went. Thank you, Quantico, for your technology. It's amazing. Um, so how do you end up how do you end up balancing it? There was a special master that went through the 10 million documents. And I spent 30 days with this law firm at McDermott, Will and Emery uh, in the city, going through documents, recordings, everything to ensure that there was no attorney client privilege and that nothing was between just attorneys. So if you have two attorneys and say Ivanka on you know the document on an email chain. There is no attorney-client privilege because having a non-attorney onto it breaks the privilege. Not to mention, Donald himself broke the privilege. He said, I don't care. Let him say whatever he wants. I have nothing to hide. Okay, great. He have nothing to hide. Now, look what's happening three and a half, four years later. We all know there was plenty to hide. Um, there's also something called the crime fraud exception rule. And this is what the prosecutors do. They tell you everything is part of the crime fraud exception rule. So legitimately... You could fight till, you know, till the end of time. And they will just continuously tell you, well, that's a crime. And under the crime fraud exception rule, it doesn't apply. So it's a very, it's, it's a very good question. It's a tough question. It's sort of something you have to take on an ad hoc basis. Uh, there were certain documents that were not released. And they weren't relevant to any of these cases, but they were attorney-client privileged. And so they weren't released. And, um, you know, I respected the attorney-client privilege. He owns the privilege, not me as the lawyer. Um, but, you know, once, the, for example, Rudy Giuliani started coming out and lying and making statements about, oh, I transcribed this recording and that's not what it says. Well, uh, okay. Uh, I mean, poor Rudy, right? I mean, what, a, what an absolute shame. America's mayor. Could you imagine? It's like America's embarrassment. So, you know, I said, just do me a favor and please just listen to it. Listen to it yourself. And then it was given to um, CNN. And I think Chris Cuomo ended up putting it out there. And lo and behold, um, that was the end of that specific attorney-client privilege communication, even though it really wasn't. But 
it's on an ad hoc basis. I mean, it's a very circular answer. <laughs> All right, next question. Uh, Trump has a history of cheating people in his real estate career. What? So, Can you um, do me a favor? Read, start, do I start that one over? Read that again? <clears throat> it's an assertion that Trump has a history of cheating people in his real estate career. So why do supporters of Trump ignore that? Because they're stupid. I mean, as, as, as I was, there's no other way to describe it. You know, <laughs> I constantly refer to the Trump organization. It is the cult of Donald J. Trump. You walk into the Trump building on Fifth Avenue, his name is all over the place. You go into the elevator, its name is all over the place. You come up to the 26th floor, his name is everywhere. You're drinking the water, it's Trump ice. I mean, it's, it's Trump, 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 Trump. And you just don't get away. You want to have lunch, you go down to the Trump grill or the Trump bar. You know, or you could even go and get to the Trump ice cream parlor that's down there. Everything is there. That is his world. And so... You know, why do people follow him that are in Alabama or Arkansas or any of these other, you know, sort of incredibly red states? I don't know the answer for it. There's something inherent. It's like an inherent racism, sexism, misogyny, xenophobia, homophobia, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism that this guy brings out in people and they just want to express it. You know, this whole nonsense with the Second Amendment that you should have a right to own an AR-15. And if you take away someone's right for an AR-15, that means you're taking away their handguns, their shotguns, you're taking away their, you know, their ability to defend themselves. He manages to somehow appeal to the worst part of anyone and they just latch on to it so this next question uh, you know has to do with um one of the things that uh, you were saying before that you get accused of um did you help launder russian money for trump no no <laughs> in fact i don't know if that's even a true statement about trump laundering money Remember, I started in 2006, 2007. This allegedly was in the 90s, um, you know, when this happened. Eric Trump made the statement, and I think we should get him up here, and he should certainly be able to answer that, though at the time I don't even think he was born. Um, look, the kids like their father are just stupid. There's no other way to... There, I mean, Eric is the dumbest of, of the top three, uh, and it's, it's really it's, it's an absolute shame because he... Not only is he dumb, but he, he talks. So, you know, if you're stupid, you should know that you're stupid and keep your mouth shut. It's about, you know, my grandmother used to say that. <laughs> you can't argue with stupid. Let him speak because they embarrass themselves. That's Eric. Now, Don, interestingly enough, happens to be the inherently the smartest of them all. It's not Ivanka. Everybody thinks, oh, it's Ivanka, Ivanka, yeah, Ivanka, right? It's not Ivanka. She's the most prepared. She's the most phony like her father but i believe don is probably the smartest but he's just i don't know what happened to him um but for god's sakes it's not the same donald jr that i remember from when i was working there he's lost his mind um and i have no idea what's caused it but no i don't believe that there was money laundering in fact oh we got to go back to the press on this one the media made an allegation that my father-in-law, the big Russian mobster, right, who happens to be Ukrainian and was in the uh, garment industry, he had a fa fabric dyeing company, you know, until he ultimately retired, and not the Russian mobster that he was claimed to be by the press. Allegedly, my father-in-law loaned Donald Trump $100 million. I wish to God I knew where that money was today, but he loaned him $100 million to save his, him and his company. So I'll never forget, right after we read that, my mother-in-law turned around and said to my father-in-law, uh, why didn't you ask me for permission? You know? <laughs> so it was, it was, it was, it's comical. I mean, the press just makes up stuff. They go with it. Why? Because they're looking for those clicks. They're advertising money and so on. So I don't believe that there was any Russian money laundering does in his apartment buildings, which are condominiums in there. You know, the way you purchase them, like... Any piece of property is called a fee simple absolute. That means that you actually own your block and lot number, not as opposed to a co-op where it's shares into that block and lot. Yes, there are Russians that own in there. Some of these Russians happen to be from Long Island that decided to move to New York. There are some. And we have the Saudi, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has a floor, for example, at Trump World Tower. Does that mean that you know he was laundering money from the Saudis? There it's New York. It's a 
you know, it's it's the melting pot of America. So yes, there are some, but it's a very small number. And when Eric came out and said, "Oh, we have you know Russians and they're they're buying our properties," it's again he's just stupid, and he was running his mouth in order to try to prove a point on somebody that may have said something that he found injurious to his daddy. So this next questioner says he heard you somewhere earlier this week uh, predict that Trump uh, will be indicted and indicted soon. Uh, but this person says that for months, you know, they've listened to other uh, people uh, predict that Trump would be indicted and he hasn't, uh, hasn't been. Um, and he says, he, you know, he, he hopes you're right. But, but why do you believe so strongly that an indictment will be soon? Because this is really the first time that the Department of Justice has gotten involved. You know, Merrick Garland has been very, very careful, slow walking. And I, I said this yesterday on um, on CNN. He's been slow walking this, so it's like molasses through a strainer. It's hard to it's hard to imagine, like a drip, drip of of. This is the first time, and thanks to Tish James, you know, our great New York Attorney General. Now that's a civil matter. That's just going to wipe him out financially, and. She's going, I don't know if you saw it today, she filed an injunction. She's so clever. She filed an injunction today against Donald so that he cannot move any of the assets and that he cannot um, hypothecate, transfer, sell any of these assets because they could be part of the settlement that would ultimately be due to New York pursuant to this civil case. But what she also did is she went ahead and she has now referred this to the Southern District of New York to justice um, for tax evasion, which seems to me to be the low-hanging fruit. What are, what are we doing? We should have done this from day number one. We all know that this tax evasion, they have now access to his tax returns due to that long, long, long uh, you know, litigation that first was the lawsuit, then it was, it was granted, and then he appealed, and then he lost on that, and then went to Supreme Court, he lost on that. And so they all now have his tax returns. Just take it apart. Take a look. He took over, what, 170 plus million in refunds. We all know about the inflation of his assets for his own personal ego as well as more importantly, to get benefits from insurance and so on uh, and then deflate them for tax purposes. These are all crimes. Make no mistakes. If it was any one of you in this audience, you would be with probably me at Otisville, right? I mean, it's just... Nobody else seems to have gotten away with it. And it's so blatant. It's so in our faces that for some I believe now the DOJ has no choice, especially on the tax evasion charge, uh, to, um, you know, to indict and to move forward with it. So here's a follow on question. Uh, if, if Trump is indicted, do you think he'll end up doing time? Yeah, so that's a really difficult question. Um, question to answer because I believe that he will be indicted. I believe that he will be found guilty. But do I think that they can put a former president in prison? And I think, unfortunately, the answer to that is no. And the reason I say that is because the former president, despite the fact he's dumb as a stump, he he does still have enough requisite knowledge on briefings and so on, that he could be a true danger to the national security of this country. And I promise you that he would sell any of that information to an adversary um, for a bag of tuna or for a, box, you know, for a book of stamps. He doesn't care. He's willing to do it. He doesn't care about this country. You know, this, he believes this country is here to serve him as opposed to what our founding fathers wanted, which is for the president of the United States to serve for the benefit of the people. And I think it would be very difficult, but I do believe that they would put him under a home confinement situation that would mirror a, um, the same sort of um, way that they operate the Bureau of Prisons. So, so whether, whether he's indicted or, or ends up serving time, um, this questioner asks, uh, are, are all of these lawsuits enough to break Trump and uh, his family financially? Yeah, so that's the Tish James case. So I, you know, I've been <laughs> very vocal on this one. Remember that it's a civil case, and with a civil case, the bar is lowered, uh, whereby he took the fifth on every single question for the deposition other than his name. In a civil case, you can use that in order to demonstrate guilt, or you can 
place that before, whether it's the judge or the jury, uh, depending upon how the trial goes. He will be found guilty uh, in the Tish James case. There's no doubt about that one. Well, now it creates a problem for him and in her 220 plus page lawsuit. There's the statement that the settlement, the bar at the bottom of the, the baseline settlement that she's looking for is $250 million. And everybody started talking about that the baseline is the ceiling. It is not. I, I suspect that the amount will be somewhere between $750 million to $1 billion, which he does not have. No matter how many of his supporters keep stupidly giving him money, it doesn't make a difference. He will not have that money. So he's going to have to start selling assets. And what do we know? Well, he's got a lot of golf courses, but golf courses aren't income-producing assets. Right? You're lucky if they break if they break even. He gets away with it simply because of the dues and from the bond that people put up. But that bond is not his, even though he thinks it is. It's not his. When they when they leave, he has to return it to them after a certain membership number, which of course not one of his clubs ever reaches the membership number. So it's kind of like a um, little bit of a Ponzi scheme. Those assets are not income producing. So what do you sell them for? based on who wants to buy it, whatever you think you can get for it. If he ends up selling, for example, 40 Wall Street, he owns that property for a million dollars. It's a 1.2 million square foot property. And let's say it's worth what Cushman and Wakefield is saying it's worth, 300 million. Well, he has taxes on the 299 million. So in New York, that's a 50%. So he's losing off of that 250 million, a buck and a quarter. So now he has only 125 to pay towards the 750 a billion. He doesn't have enough assets that have um, the liquidity in between in order to pay this amount off. And it, this case with Tish James will ultimately bankrupt the Trump organization. Uh, so the next two questions are about two Trump related things that happened today. And uh, one, of course, was the a decision by the January 6th committee to subpoena Trump, uh, do you believe that Trump will uh, respect the subpoena and testify? Uh, and if you were his lawyer, <laughs> and if you were his lawyer, what would you advise him to do? <laughs> so first of all, do I think he'll respect process? Uh, according to Donald, process is what he says it is, right? Also, so I could declassify something just by thinking about it, right? I, <laughs> Right. You know, it's almost like if he was able to do that, I would be, he would have like the Jedi choke on me right now and I would be on the floor. You know, the answer to that is he's not showing up. Now, of course, what does he do? Oh, big, brave, bad Donald. He's going to. I want to testify. I want to go before them. I want to make a whole thing out of this. It's not true. We've seen this act before. That's the whole thing. Why are we falling for the same nonsense again and again and again? How many times has this man turned and said, 100% I'm going to cooperate. Does he cooperate? No. Uh, I want to testify. I want the truth to be told. Oh, he takes the fifth 500 times. This is an old story. This is, this is the same Donald Trump that's been doing it since he started his practice in real estate. So the answer is no. He's not going to testify. He's not going to respect the process. He has no respect for any of the nine individuals that are on the committee, uh, you know, whether it's Adam Kinzinger, especially, or Liz Cheney, uh, Adam Schiff. He has no respect for any of them. So the answer is he will not. As far as what would I tell him um, to do if I was his attorney? Well, Morocco, I believe, uh, Namibia. These are countries that have no extradition. And so he should get on his 757, you know, which of course needs to be fixed at the expense of his supporters. He should, he should get on there. He should get the hell out of Dodge really fast because... He's in very serious trouble. And it's not just him. The kids are in trouble too. Don, Ivanka, Eric, they're, they're all in trouble. Mark Meadows, I warned them. You may remember during my House Oversight Committee when I turned around and said to him and Jim Jordan, I know what you're doing. I know the playbook. I said, you know how I know the playbook? Because I wrote it. And you can't run the playbook on me. I know it better than you do. And what's happened to me and the harm and the pain and the damage that my family has gone through you're going to know it yourself one of these days if you stand by this man. And lo and behold, once again, prescient. I told him it was going to happen, and it's happening. So the other uh, Trump-related thing that happened today involved the Supreme Court, which re uh, rejected in a, in a very brief statement a request from Trump to intervene in the litigation over 
over the documents that were seized at Mar-a-Lago. You know, Trump had, had objected to a decision by a lower court to remove the 100 classified documents from review by the special master and the uh, Supreme Court said it's just not going to not going to intervene. Uh, so the question is, wh wh what did you think about this decision, and 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 what do you think generally about the whole Mar-a-Lago uh, uh, situation? So the decision is obviously appropriate and it's correct. And finally, you know, they're doing their job as opposed to trying to play politics in the Supreme Court. I mean, let's just look at the whole Mar-a-Lago document scandal anyway. The guy is fighting to keep documents out of the NARA, which is the National Archives, and they're stolen documents. They don't belong to him. They belong to us. I mean, under the Presidential Records Act, they are not his documents. Now, some of them might be. I mean, he may have a letter from his girlfriend, Kim Jong-un, or Vladimir Putin, or something like that. love letters. I've, I mean, who, has anybody here ever turned around and said, oh yeah, I got a love letter from Vladimir Putin. It was beautiful. The most beautiful love. And Kim Jong-un. By the way, I don't even, if, if that's, if, if, you know, if that's who you like, it's great. But, you know, at least tell me to get a better haircut. It doesn't make any sense at all. Love letters. It's just, who calls a letter from one, from a supreme leader to the president of the United States a love letter? How about just call it a letter? Well, no, no. Maybe we can allow him to have that one. Okay, no problem. But you're talking about national security, top secret documents, ones that are, you know, marked not just classified, but the highest level classification that no one other than the guy who wrote it's allowed to read. That's another thing I don't understand. So if you're the guy who writes it and you're the only one that's allowed to read it, what good is it, right? It doesn't make any sense. Does somebody else get a chance to read it? Clearly not. But he has it. And he has it at Mar-a-Lardo, sitting in his, in his office above the catering facility for anybody to just walk up the nine steps Pick the lock because it's a regular medical lock. I mean, you're not talking about anything sophisticated here. Oh, that's oh, it's more secure, for example, that you said than than where the National Archives keep it. No, that's not true, Donald. That's just another one of the thirty-eight thousand million billion trillion lies that you've told the American people. It is not more secure downstairs in the subcellar. But I don't know if any of you saw the picture of the pallets of boxes that this guy took. Uh, if I was his lawyer in this one, the first thing I would have done is told him to shut up and absolutely say, I didn't pack any of those boxes. I have no idea. I don't even know why they sent the boxes to Mar-a-Lago, right? That's what he should have done. But instead, there are no documents. Then there are documents. Then there are my documents. Then the declassified documents. And then, well, they could be classified, but they're not. They're you sit there and you scratch your head and you're saying to yourself again, what's this man talking about? And how stupid is 70 million Americans to vote for him? I mean... At the end of the day, isn't that really what this is all about? Do we not want to keep our democracy the way that we have grown and seen, you know, this country? People are so, they're so confused about democracy. You believe that it's a God-given right, that somehow or another our constitution, you know, provides us with democracy. Democracy is an experiment, and it could be taken from us at any given moment, right? And again, the two ways, freedom of speech, take it, stifle it and then bring in a military or a paramilitary group, just like January 6th. So like what I said before, democracy is not a God given. We have to fight for it every single day. And that's why this midterm elections, <laughs> I mean, you wanna talk about crazy with the midterm elections? All of a sudden, we're gonna end up with a big, big problem come uh, November, if in fact Democrats take the House and the Senate. I promise you, within 30 minutes of, the, of their being inducted, Joe Biden's going to be impeached. And if they control the Senate as well, it's going to be a bigger problem because they will probably convict him on that as well. And they'll do the same with Kamala Harris. And then they're going to absolutely destroy the entire Democratic Party because they think that they can, because they want to, because each and every one of them is on a power trip. Mark Meadows, Jim Jordan, you know, all, all of they're all on a power trip. And it's our obligation. It's our responsibility to the next generation and the generations to come to stop it. So I've got one more question here. Um, not quite sure what to make of it. It's a little bit off point. Um, but I'm going to ask it because uh, it's, it's, it says that it's from two or three people who know you. Oh, boy. So do you eat <sighs> eggs or chicken? OK, so I've never had a piece of chicken in my life. Um, never tried it. Don't eat chicken soup. I'm chicken phobic. Why that's relevant? 
don't know, but thank you all for bringing that to the forefront. Um, you know, <laughs> I'm sure that's going to help us save our democracy. <laughs> all right, Michael Cohen, thank you so much. Thank you.